So once again, a pleasant evening to everyone. For the rationale of our topic for this evening, the interconnectedness of human health, climate change, and society. So climate change is deemed the biggest global health threat for the 21st century. It has brought about passively irreversible alterations to the Earth's geological, biological, and ecological systems. These changes have led to the emergence of large-scale environmental hazards to human health, such as extreme weather, ozone depletion, increased danger of wildfires, loss of biodiversity, stresses to food-producing systems, and the global spread of infectious diseases. With that, this webinar lecture would like to explore the interrelationship between climate change, health, and society its effects and how we as the primary stewards of the environment can help combat climate change and its adverse effects. Our speaker for tonight is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Engineering at Don Bosco Technical College, Philippines as top five of the graduating class and as president of the College Student Council. He has graced both local and international speaking engagements in Germany, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. So, Please help me welcome our speaker for this evening, no other than Engineer Ludwig O. Federigan. Sir, good evening. This one I want to present to you, uh, the interconnectedness of human health, climate change, and, uh, and society. Early on, um, when the lockdown was uh, declared by the president in the middle of March uh, 2020, I would remember that I just came from Cagayan at the time. And while I was in Cagayan de Oro, there was the first case uh, uh, pronounced in uh, Cagayan. And uh, that person was actually uh, placed in a hospital very near the hotel where I was staying. Uh, I was in Cagayan because we were, we were organizing the local climate change action plan for Lano del Norte at that time. You know? So uh, when we came back to, the, to Manila, I, uh, the weekend before the declaration of the lockdown, uh, for Luzon, uh, there was an immediate meeting uh, in Climate Change Commission, and uh, we were told that uh, starting the next day, that was Tuesday, um, uh, we are no longer be allowed to go come into the office because the, the president would declare that night uh, there would be a lockdown the following day. You know? And one of the first questions that were asked uh, at the start of the pandemic was whether there is a relationship between the pandemic or the coronavirus, uh, coronavirus and uh, climate change. No? And one of the shortest answers uh, that we have at the time, way back in March, the real answer is there is really no relationship between coronavirus and climate change. When I talk there are no relationship, I'm talking there are no direct relationship between uh, climate change and uh, coronavirus. No? So that, that was a statement, even a couple of scientists uh, in the US, which I followed, uh, have the same opinion that there are no relationship of the climate change and, and uh, the coronavirus. No? But let me just go back at the start of the century when, uh, of course, I, I suppose that you have heard uh, during the Spanish flu, the Spanish flu way back in 1918, that was the height of World War I. Um, I, gave you, I gave you that assignment why it, was, it is called the, the Spanish flu, not because uh, the Spanish flu originated from Spain, you know, but uh, try to find out why uh, it was called uh, the Spanish flu. Now, during that time, we know that around 50 million people maximum were killed, and uh, it, the estimates may have run almost 100 million because they say that the recording process at the time over a hundred years ago are not uh, as, uh, as, as, uh, as easy as it is uh, right now. No? In the Philippines, based on studies, uh, we have a total of maximum of the 90 deaths, no? but still uh, that number is not so certain because the, all medical record keeping uh, are, are not complete. No? And we know that flu or influenza is a highly contagious viral infection. That mainly affects the respiratory system of, uh, of a human being. You know? uh, it, is, uh, it is more severe than a common cold. You know? More severe than a common cold. Flu symptoms actually can, can uh, include sudden onset fever, cough, running nose, or stuffy nose, or severe, severe malaise. You know? 
this flu can also sometimes cause vomiting, diarrhea, and uh, nausea. No? But the flu is primarily uh, a respiratory disease and not a stomach or intent intestinal uh, disease. No? So when a person uh, is infected with a cough, sneezes, or talks, or or talks the respiratory droplets are generated and transmitted into the air and then can be inhaled by anyone nearby. No? Similarly to the symptoms or to the, to the manifestation that we see right now no? uh, during this uh, coronavirus. No? But uh, if you get to look at it, uh, this virus uh, that we have right now, which is called corona or novel corona disease 2019, it's almost as vulnerable as it was in 19, uh, it was in 1918. No? Uh, the virus is not yet uh, contained uh, as of the moment. We know that the numbers uh, uh, continue to, to increase. And uh, of course, we expect uh, more deaths uh, that may be reported uh, in the coming days. No? So let's move now. Um, how did this happen? No? So the last day of December of last year, uh, this health commission in Wuhan, China, reported a cluster cases of pneumonia. Take note of the dates because the dates are pretty important, no? especially when uh, when we talk of the Philippine uh, situation. No? So this was really uh, the news came from China. I think uh, there are certain news that this has been there since September, but uh, that news remains uh, to be unverified. No? And then uh, some of these cases may have been uh, concealed no? uh, to the to the international community, as they say. No? But during the initial transmission. Immediately, there were 41 confirmed cases no, in, uh, in uh, Wuhan, China. No? And uh, they see that uh, people there was not surprised that eventually there might be human-to-human -human transmission, similarly to what happened to SARS, to MERS, and other uh, respiratory diseases. No? But right after uh, the day uh, before that, uh, Thailand reported its first case no, of the coronavirus. No? Uh, in the Philippines, the first case was reported way back in January 30, uh, 2020. You know? And uh, this case was reported when there was a, a couple who traveled from Dumaguete to Cebu and contracted uh, the virus. You know? okay. I think I've been there. Okay, I think I have seen that. You know? So on March 11, the World Health Organization declared the novel coronavirus a pandemic. Uh, of course, in the international community or for WHO, there are levels of the there are levels of declaration before a, a pandemic is the, is uh, finally declared. No, and uh, we know it is a pandemic because it has already uh, affected uh, a number of countries uh, uh, worldwide. No? Now, let us just look. Uh, the difference between SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. No? Uh, SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. So according to U.S. Center for Disease Control and uh, Prevention, coronavirus is the name for crown-like spike on their surface. No? So this is how it looks like in, uh, you know, when science would, would uh, describe it. It is actually a family of viruses that usually cause mild to moderate upper respiratory Track illnesses like uh, the common cold. No? According to science, there are actually seven known coronaviruses that infect human beings. No? Take note, seven. And four of these are already known to us. No? And these are the four uh, coronaviruses that are already known to us. These are the alpha coronavirus uh, with that code 20T9E, Al another alpha coronavirus with that code NL63, beta coronavirus and another beta coronavirus and the remaining three coronaviruses that we know as of today cause more fatal diseases and this one is the, of course we know SARS-CoV which was coming from the beta coronavirus that causes severe acute respiratory syndrome or short is SARS this another one is MERS-CoV which is the beta coronavirus that causes Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or uh, for short, MERS. And of course, the latest and the one that we have, this is the SARS-CoV-2, or the novel coronavirus that causes corona, 
virus disease 2019 or what we call uh, the COVID-19. Uh, no? If you get a look at it, uh, the SARS-CoV happened way back in 2003 to uh, 2004. And uh, we know that this, this virus actually came from uh, Guangdong, China, when a number of people was also uh, affected. But looking back when they traced this, this virus, they said that this originally originated from bats. No? Bats, no? but uh, the virus of bats cannot be transmittable to human beings. So there is a need for what they call an intermediary animal. And this intermediary animal are civets, no? And civets was able to transmit this kind of virus uh, to human beings. No? SARS-CoV actually spread to 26 countries and infected over 8,000 people and approximately 774 people died during that time. In the Philippines, uh, we know that the Department of Health was very fast in responding to this virus. We only have a total of 12 probable SARS cases at the time with only two deaths. No? In fact, WHO congratulated the Philippines at the time because we have a very efficient surveillance and reporting system in the Philippines, which makes uh, us uh, uh, to be very fast in uh, providing immediate response to this particular virus. No? Since 2004, there are no more reported cases of SARS-CoV, of SARS-CoV, no, which they say perhaps to be the SARS-CoV-1. The next virus is MERS or MERS-CoV, no, which actually was identified in 2012 and caused, uh, and they said that this is again caused by bats, but the intermediary animal was different. No? And since this originated mostly from Middle East, the intermediary animal that was identified through research are actually camels. No? So before it was transmitted to human beings. No? So this mers uh, which happened first in Saudi Arabia, spread to 27 countries. No? And from that emergence, and from that emergence, um, there were only 2,519 cases uh, from MERS and only 866 people died, now, most of them coming from Saudi Arabia. No? Based on the research that I did, the Philippines only had two reported cases, both of them are foreigners, and only one suspected death. No? So these are the two first cases, the two first cases of the uh, coronavirus, the fatal ones. No? But the one that we have right now, which is the coronavirus 2, no? This is quite different, although this was reported in China or China also, uh, and based on studies, this was also originated uh, from bats, but there's also another intermediate animal. No? Based on studies, they say that the intermediate animals are pangolins. No? I don't know whether you have seen a pangolin. Uh, they are they can be seen in the Philippines. You can see them uh, predominantly in, uh, in uh, Palawan. That's why pangolin is one of the highly trafficked animals uh, in the country. Uh, it's also a big, uh, a big uh, biodiversity issue in, uh, in Palawan. No? And uh, even during the pandemic, uh, trafficking of, the, of pangolin remains to be uh, very, very high. No? I wanted to show to you uh, this uh, slide, this one. Uh, this is actually a study done way back in 2007. And in this study, uh, what is ironic in this study, there is a statement here that suggests that SARS can return if conditions are still fit for the introduction, mutation, amplification, and transmission of this dangerous virus. So way back in 2017, there was already a warning that a similar coronavirus uh, may happen uh, to humanity. So you can, you can see that there. Now let's try to link uh, how this happened and let's try to link how this thing may have become an impact of environmental degradation that eventually can be linked to, to climate change. No? 
Okay, I, I think I said that. Okay. Science would say that the process of the infectious diseases that are transmitted to animals, to humans, are called zoonosis, no? or zoonosis. No? So these, these are transmitted by various routes, including via direct contact, uh, via food, via drinking water, via re recreational water, and anthropod vectors. No? Many zoonoses, like the West Nile virus and Lyme diseases, are only transmittable from animal reservoir host to humans without human-to-human -human transmission. So take note, there are also zoonoses that can only be transmitted directly from animals to humans. And humans cannot transmit it to other humans. No? And this is quite different uh, from coronavirus no? because the first transmission is a zoonotic transmission because there is animals to humans, but eventually transmission becomes to humans to humans. No? So if you get to look at it, when science would uh, try to study it, the transmission from animals to humans may be directly linked to climate change, but the transmission to humans to humans, there are no direct uh, to climate change. But let us, try, try, let us try to unlock also what may have been the indirect uh, relationship of climate change regarding, uh, regarding uh, transmission. So notic diseases is not only a present term, this was not only uh, discovered very recently, even the Bible have already made mention, made mention of the zoonotic diseases. No? Uh, this appeared actually in books of the, uh, those who are studying uh, biodiversity, biodiversity conservation. No? So zoonotic diseases are actually uh, not due to humans. This has been recorded uh, in entire human history. No? In part of the Bible, uh, uh, these actually I'll talk about bats. Uh, let me just jump on that. Uh, this one, uh, this uh, physician also made mention uh, during the time of the of the Greek period. No? Uh, they mentioned uh, this uh, linkage uh, of the zoonotic diseases, no? uh, the transmission of the diseases from animal uh, and to human beings. No? So let us, let's now move uh, the intersection of the climate change and uh, human health. Even the WHO have already identified that uh, they considered climate change to be the greatest threat to global health no, in the 21st century. And uh, that actually has been articulated in the uh, global uh, risk report that is published by the World Economic Forum every year. Uh, every January, and uh, this is part of the latest publication that came out last January uh, 2020. And climate change, they said, uh, in the latest study of Ipsos, they said that climate change remains to be a biggest concern among all uh, among the global community. No? And uh, in fact, the global community looks that climate change uh, should be addressed no, by uh, the whole of society approach, no? not only uh, by government. No? But if we would try to study very deeply, there is always the relationship between weather, between climate, and between uh, human health. No? And uh, that is not only at present, even in the early history, uh, it has been there and has been pronounced uh, through a lot of readings, uh, uh, the intersection of climate change, weather, and uh, human health. We've seen that the last five years for the warmest on record and uh, disasters are becoming more intense and more frequently. No? In uh, 2009, we witnessed unprecedented weather, uh, heat and cold waves, heavy rainfalls and floods, tropical cyclones, severe storms, drought, and wildfires. No? And uh, we know that at present, our global temperature, we are headed towards a, uh, a three degrees Celsius, uh, which is double than the target of the Paris Agreement uh, that was signed way back in uh, 2015. We know that the overall goal of the Paris Agreement is to limit uh, the temperature way below the two degrees Celsius at least to have an aspirational goal to achieve only a temperature increase 
not more than 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. And we know over history, no, the decline, the decline of the of the, our greenhouse gas emissions, even during pandemic, is expected because total industrial activity is down. But if you look at history, similar declines also happen, no, just like during the World War II, during the 1991 to 1992 recession, and even during the last global financial crisis. No? But even if this decline, uh, even during pandemic, no, uh, would have been manifested, we expect that once the entire global economy would go back, uh, we expect that uh, emissions would continue to grow, to, to go up. You know? uh, and uh, we would be back to a situation where we were during the pre-pandemic uh, pre -pandemic times. You know? We've seen that the We've seen actually that the first three months of 2020 were actually the second warmest records uh, in human history. And even in 2019, uh, over a lot of communities or municipalities or cities worldwide have declared climate emergency declaration. As of the December of 2019, around 800 million people living in places that have declared climate emergency uh, is, uh, has been uh, more pronounced. No? Uh, in the Philippines, there were also a couple of local government units that have declared uh, climate emergencies. No? Uh, I can say some of one of them was uh, Bacolod City, another one was uh, Tolosa uh, in Leyte, and there's a group of uh, municipalities in uh, Tacloban led by uh, Tacloban City and the nearby cities who declared climate emergency as early as August of last year. Uh, I was present during that declaration and I was so happy seeing mayors you know, declaring climate emergencies in their respective uh, localities. Even our national panel of the technical experts, uh, okay, uh, I used this photo, sorry, no, uh, I think I was also included in that photo, submitted a resolution to the Climate Change Commission last February, uh, calling for the declaration of the climate emergency, you know, hoping that the president will really declare a climate emergency with an expectation, the need for government data uh, to be consolidated so that uh, people would have only uh, access, uh, one government agency to access the climate risk uh, data available uh, to to all of us. No? And if I'm not mistaken, the Climate Change Commission have transmitted this resolution uh, to the Office of the President. And uh, we know that recently, of past few weeks, uh, the call to re to, for the declaration of climate emergency has been revived. We've seen that the latest typhoons that hit the Philippines, the last being Ulysses, um, have put forward that uh, indeed national government should play part, no, especially in the declaration of the of the, the climate uh, emergency. Uh, you might ask later on whether I would have inside information, whether there's a possibility that the national government would declare. Um, uh, to be very honest, I don't have any information uh, to that effect. Uh, there are no uh, inkling or mga, mga pasakali na nanggagaling sa palasyo, no? whether uh, the Office of the President would uh, declare a national a climate emergency. I, I, just like you, is wishing that uh, they would declare a climate emergency. Last year, uh, one of my last columns in December of 2019, I was expecting the president to declare a climate emergency. And I was asking uh, the president that uh, let this be the, let this be his the gift, Christmas gift to the Filipino nation. But apparently, of course, uh, that didn't happen. I'm hoping still that the president would uh, make such declaration before the end of the year 2020. Here, uh, I want to show you the, now the relationship between uh, climate change and uh, human health. And uh, we know uh, in various studies, uh, there are really a clear connection, uh, although in a varying complexity, scale, and directness, and uh, with different uh, timing. These health impacts actually include temperature-related illnesses and death, 
extreme weather-related health effects like injury and loss of life, air polluted related health effects that will exacerbate cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, water and foodborne diseases, vector-borne and rotten-borne diseases like malaria, dengue, or leptopyrosis, effects of food and water shortages, and distress and mental trauma from displacement, as well as loss of livelihoods and property. No? One scientist has said that climate change is clearly a factor that can influence this uh, relationship. In his interview with the Carbon Free, he added that climate change shapes the biogeographical distribution of species. And if in the future we see species moving into areas where humans are prevalent, we could see new opportunities for pandemics to evolve. No? Well, uh, just to emphasize on that, if there is a continued destruction of the environment and we push animals uh, more closer to human beings, no? uh, there is always that possibility that a pandemic uh, more pronounced and more severe than coronavirus would still happen. And I suppose that the next problem, if we would have pandemic 2.0, uh, and if we are not prepared in terms of the availability of vaccine, I will not discount the possibility that another lockdown similar to what we had uh, last March until June or July uh, would happen. No? I'm talking in the context of here in Luzon. No? And I guess in the area in Southern Mindanao, especially I think uh, in the city of Davao, where cases uh, continue to, to increase no? on a day-to-day -day basis. No? While science would say that clim changing climate may not have directly or directly caused COVID-19 or affected its spread, According to the World Health Organization, but climate change could, in fact, affect the world's response uh, to pandemic because people affected by climate change is similar to the people affected by climate change. I mean, people affected by the pandemic are the same people affected by climate change. And this, we talk of the marginalized uh, sectors of society. These are the poor, these are the young people, these are the children, these are the indigenous people. Uh, these are actually women and young girls no? uh, in other countries, no? not necessarily uh, in the Philippines. These are also would include our seniors, including our uh, persons uh, with uh, disabilities. No? Okay. In here, you will be able to see that based on the World Economic Forum uh, 2020 Global uh, Risk Report, they, uh, they mentioned that major biodiversity loss or ecosystem collapse with irreversible consequences for the environment, resulting in severe depleted resources for humankind, uh, as well as the industries. Now, so when we look at coronavirus, we also have to see uh, the damage that we brought to our uh, biodiversity. You know? So when we talk of biodiversity, it involves the entire ecosystem you know, uh, available uh, to us. These are the relationships of all human or living things. So these include animals, these include all other living things, you know, including, uh, including human beings, because we all belong to one uh, ecosystem. You know? In the latest assessment report uh, given by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity Ecosystem Services, no? this was compiled actually by 145 experts coming from uh, 50 countries. No? When they reviewed 15,000 scientific and government sources, no? they released that nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history and at the rate of species extinction, a million species threatened with extinction. You know? And this is accelerating okay. and endangering economies, livelihoods, food security, and the quality of life mm -hmm. of people everywhere. I don't know whether you were able to catch this report. This was released last year. You know? 
And uh, when this was released last year globally, there were a lot of front page, uh, there are a lot of newspapers who put this in the headline, no? that uh, we expect a total decline of the of species by as much as 1 million uh, species. So when I talk of species, we're talking of the plants, animals, and uh, marine life. No? And I would also include human beings because uh, for me, human beings are also endangered species. No? And based on this report, we expect that 82% there would be a decline of the wild mammals, 47% there would be a decline in natural ecosystem, 25% decline in plant and animal species, that will be threatened with uh, extinction and 23% uh, decline in abundance of the, our naturally present uh, land species. No? So this is the report that I was saying. This uh, report, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was released way back in May or June of the 2019. Uh, it's a nice report. If you have the time to read, uh, it's downloadable uh, through the website of the IPBEST. No? Uh, and of course, we could see that uh, these are the human activities that are very prevalent, uh, that provides impacts on that particular report. And this include harvesting, logging, hunting, fishing, no? uh, that actually affect most of the animals, forest, including uh, plants no? uh, in the forest no? or in our, in our forest and, uh, and our watershed. No? In this report, uh, way back in 2015, uh, made or authored by the Con Convention on Bio Biological Diversity and uh, WHO, it says how biodiversity loss can destabilize ecosystem, you know, promote outbreaks on infectious diseases. Now, coronavirus is actually an infectious disease and undermine development progress, nutrition, and protection from natural disasters. It, it is driven actually by population growth, trade, consumption patterns, and urbanization. We've seen also that during coronavirus and during lockdown, we've seen that economic activity is at its lowest. In the Philippines, we've seen that for the past three quarters, our gross domestic product uh, contracted from 0.7 to negative 16%, and I think in the third quarter, that was around, if I'm not mistaken, negative 9%. Uh, this year, we are projected to decline on a year-on-year -year basis around 11% uh, of, of our uh, economic uh, activity. Now, let me just uh, share with you uh, why the future is in our hands. So, uh, I is actually part of my paper that I wrote for Strat-based uh, and they publish it in their uh, website. You, know? uh, you can actually Google Stratbase and uh, you can actually look for the paper uh, of the same title. You know? uh, as, the, as the climate and biodiversity crisis uh, continue to evolve, uh, recent pandemics are direct consequences of the human activity, particularly even the last global financial and economic uh, system that apprised economic growth at uh, at any cost. No? And we know that the only single species responsible for this are humans. No? Now sometimes I really question myself whether humans is actually the most intelligent species in this planet. No? We know that both COVID-19 and climate change are serious crises. The same way that uh, that Ipsos study that I mentioned earlier, when 71% of citizens globally agreed. No? Both are health emergencies, but of different kinds. One, disease spreads like wildfire, and with the other, if you will, wildfire spreads diseases. Now, this is according uh, to just uh, Carliner of the Healthcare uh, Without Arm. Actually, another history professor at the Columbia University uh, called the present economic situation that the world is facing today as a full body seizure whose widespread impacts in magnitude and proportion will continue. It is therefore prudent that in addressing our post COVID-19 economic recovery, we should focus our plans on the existential threat of the climate uh, emergency. Now, let me just share with you some lessons of the ongoing pandemic. First, of course, 
it tells us that we are all connected. Human health and the health of this planet or our common home go together. This pandemic clearly reminds us that our total being and the health of this planet are closely related. During, during uh, way back 25 years ago, there is a group of scientists and sent a warning to humanity in a form of a letter. And they called that letter the World Scientist Warning to Humanity. It was written by 1,700 scientists. Most of them are actually recipient of Nobel Prize awards. And they called on humanity to curtail environmental destruction and caution that a great change in our stewardship of this planet and the life on it is required. Otherwise, vast human misery uh, cannot be avoided. And if we continue to cut down forests, if we continue to drive away indigenous people, if we poison the soil and the water, and we destroy entire animal and plant species, there is nothing left for humans to enjoy. We kill over 100 billion animals annually to feed our appetite. Moreover, even despite scientists warning made 25 years ago, we continue to destroy natural habitats that, pu that pushes wild animals much closer to human beings. The second lesson is COVID-19 caught us by surprise. No? I guess everybody is surprised when COVID-19 came. Uh, perhaps it's just a dream, but uh, it's a reality. Uh, initially, we thought it would be solved in a matter of weeks, and then it became months. Now we're actually half a year in this, uh, in this virus. No? It clearly shows that humans are not ready, and we, are not, we, are, we have not pre prepared enough uh, for COVID-19 you know, or for this kind of the, for this kind of the pandemic, you know? with the immediate attention to flatten the curve, you no, know, as what science says, you no, know, our health system are continued to be overwhelmed with continued reported cases of the COVID-19. You know? At the start of the pandemic. Uh, there was a study that came out called the Ready Score, which measures the country's ability to find, stop, and prevent health threats. No? And in this score, in this Ready Score index, unfortunately, the Philippines only scored 52, way below the passing mark of 80% or higher, which indicates their country should be ready for an epidemic. No? which means that there are a lot of things of, to be done for the next epidemic uh, to come. No? According to the study, there has to be focus on our health system no? by, in, by strengthening our national laboratory system, our surveillance, our workforce development, especially our frontliners, our preparedness, our emergency response operation, strengthening risk communication and national legislation policy including financing the third lesson of this pandemic is health threats like covid19 and the climate emergency cannot be isolated it requires global cooperation because we know that climate change and this disease global i mean covid19 these are problems without passports no? and they do not recognize national boundaries. No? So they will continue to threaten uh, human society and uh, we require, it requires global cooperation to address these twin problems. No? Actually, this morning I was attending a media forum attended, of course, by media practitioners and uh, communication practitioners uh, from the industry, including uh, HEIs. No? Those those universities implementing uh, uh, communication uh, courses. No? And uh, the same thing actually came out in that particular uh, breakout session when these people started sharing how they look at the intersection or the interconnectedness of health and uh, climate emergency. The fourth lesson, I'm almost done. Uh, the fourth lesson 
Uh, while the government response is key in this crisis, uh, the private sector plays an equal critical role no, in addressing uh, COVID-19. Uh, We've seen that during the pandemic, there are a lot of the donations made by the private sector. Even a private non-government organization have also mobilized uh, donation drives or donation drives, especially to help our frontliners, uh, our doctors, our nurses, our aides, the hospital aides, so they will be able to uh, cope with, you know, not only because they need PPEs, face masks, or face shield, but including uh, their mobility because they are uh, challenged in moving from their homes uh, going, to, going to the hospitals. You know? And the last challenge, of course, or the last lesson is, it is time uh, to shift gears and embrace uh, systems change. You know? For a long period of time, this has been the total call of the advocates that government should start looking on how we can shift gears and uh, how we can uh, have a paradigm shift as far as our systems are concerned. No? We know that these frameworks that we have in front of us, the Sunday framework for DRR that was signed in March 2015, the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development that was signed in September 2015, and of course, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change that was signed in December 2015, these are all uh, very important frameworks and should be always regarded in our uh, post-COVID-19 uh, development process. No? Because I believe that to achieve uh, our green recovery, we can no longer back, go back to the old system uh, that we used to have. No? And looking forward no, to address our climate emergency, there are a lot of climate positive policies that offer superior economic characteristics. No? Experts have said that uh, experts have said that uh, this has to be considered so that uh, uh, we remain true to our uh, call that there should be uh, no person left behind, or if in the Philippines there should be. Uh, no uh, Filipino uh, left behind. No? Because we know that uh, if we continue to do uh, the business as usual thinking, we will continue to drive our planet much deeper into existential, economic, social, and ecological turmoil caused not only by COVID-19, but including the climate crisis. No? Kasi hindi naman po nawala si climate change no? kahit uh, nandyan po si COVID-19. No? So, uh, there has to be a call for ambitious actions to cut carbon emissions, and that has to be more pronounced than ever. No, uh, that has to be more pronounced uh, uh, than ever. Therefore, our quest for environmental uh, stewardship should balance public health, climate change, and economic prosperity. In designing our balanced approach to COVID-19 recovery including climate-friendly and sustainable recovery, focus should be made on healthcare investments, disaster preparedness, clean research and development spending, and clean energy infrastructure. Moreover, having no Filipino left behind, it is equally important also that it addresses existential, societal, and political concerns such as poverty alleviation, inequality and social inclusion. Our society should continue to work together. As we have shown in our fight against the global health pandemic, the task at hand looks Herculean, but as part of the most intelligent and resilient species, we can surmount these challenges. And our policymakers should ensure that these goals are not lost in the post-COVID-19 world. So I guess uh, this ends my presentation. Thank you so much for lending your ears for, uh, I don't know, for how many minutes. Uh, I hope I didn't uh, exceed the time allotted uh, for me. Thank you, thank you so much for listening. All right, thank you so much, Engineer Federigan. And indeed, it is truly a pleasure having you in this webinar. Uh, thank you so much for sharing with us these insights on the interplay between climate change, health, and society in general. 
uh, it's really interesting how these three interact with each other and how each create this um, spider web that overall affects not only us, but the planet. Um, with that, uh, these words from Sir David Attenborough come into mind. Uh, quote, we are at a unique stage in our history and never before had have we had such an awareness of what we are doing to the planet and never before have we had the power to do something about that. Surely we have the responsibility to care for our blue planet. The future of humanity and indeed all life on earth now depends on us." Unquote. Now enough of that, um, I'm pretty sure that our participants already have some questions in mind, but before we proceed to the open forum, um, may I just remind everyone that we have an online attendance sheet uh, the link is available at the chat box and please fill them out as this will be the basis for the Secretariat in sending out the certificates of participation. Again, the online attendance sheet is available at the chat box. So, all right, um, in this juncture, we will be proceeding with the open forum. Again, if you have any questions, queries you would like to raise, um, please raise your hand. We're prompting the raise hand icon at the bottom end of your screens so that we can recognize you. Or you may also type in your questions at the chat box. So with that, um, the floor is now open for questions. Now to start off, um, I think we have a question from Mr. Ray Caubalejo. Uh, it goes, the Philippines is highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, including sea rise level, increased frequency of extreme weather events, rising temperatures, and extreme rainfall. Um, sir, do you think that the recent typhoons that hit the Philippines in the last quarter of the year is a product of climate change? Thank you so much for, for that question. Um, I do not want to be misquoted no, because uh, normally when there are typhoons, uh, there is what we call uh, an attribution, attribution science no, to be conducted. Uh, what is the percent of the influence uh, of climate in every uh, extreme weather event. You know? But uh, we have to take note that uh, in changing our narrative, uh, any, any disaster, uh, even that happened, the, the recent Typhoon Ulysses, can no longer be called uh, natural disasters because at uh, present time, there are no such data, uh, natural disasters anymore because most of the disasters, uh, first and foremost, we have to qualify uh, how a disaster is, the, is defined as this. Uh, we know the hazards, okay? We know the hazards, there are natural hazards and that one cannot be uh, discounted. And one becomes a disaster if the people die or there are damages uh, to property, okay? Take note, people die, damages to property, or the national government or local government unit would declare a state of the calamity, or if there would be a call for international humanitarian assistance. Right? So any, any of these four elements, uh, uh, if they are present, any one of these elements, if it is present, that would be called a natural disaster, no? So clearly what happened in project, I mean, in, in Typhoon Ulysses that happened recently, uh, perhaps we were just uh, focusing, for example, in Metro Manila, but when uh, the call for help of Cagayan Valley province uh, went into social media, and we've seen how devastated uh, Cagayan province, no, as far as the flooding situation is concerned, clearly it is a disaster no? because definitely in a flooding situation, there is damage uh, to property. If whether we are certain these are uh, whether we are certain these are uh, climate related events, if we are going to look at science, uh, climate change will intensify uh, will intensify typhoons in terms of the in terms of the strength of the wind and in terms of the, the amount of rainfall. So if we look at science, uh, we can say initially, perhaps that the, 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 the typhoon Ulysses may be perceived as a climate-related event, no? but that has, to be at, that has to be validated. A specific study, which we call uh, attribution science, has to be made 
so that we will be able to see what is the percent of influence of climate change in this particular uh, extreme weather event. You know? Because as I say, uh, throughout human history, uh, there are weather events no? uh, that may not be human-induced, but at present, uh, we can say that uh, same weather events are human-induced, but it would require an attribution study to say the level of influence of the climate change. I hope I answered your question uh, sufficiently. All right, thank you, sir. Um, another question po from Mr. Caubalejo. Uh, in July 2017, the Philippine Senate voted unanimously to, the, to ratify the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and joined 133 other parties representing more than 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The Philippines has committed to cut its car carbon emissions by 70% by 2030. Do you think that the country will be able to achieve this target goal? That's a very tough question. Can I see the face of the person who asked that question? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, where is he? <laughs> Uh, see, sir, I, see. Oh, there, there. I can see him. I can see him. Okay. Let me answer that question. Okay. Uh, we know that the Paris Agreement, the accession of instrument uh, of the Republic of the Philippines was actually deposited in the United Nations uh, after the president have signed that in 2017. Actually, before the president uh, became president in uh, June of, the, of the 2016, uh, we know that during the time of the, the former president, uh, Noy Noy Aquino, uh, that has already been approved, the Paris Agreement. But uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there has to be another route uh, so that the present administration would have a buy-in on the, on the Paris Agreement. Initially, at uh, the start of the, of the present administration, uh, the early months of the 2016, there were some uh, news that uh, the president may not eventually sign uh, the Paris Agreement. So that would explain perhaps the delay uh, of the entering of the session of instrument of the, the Philippines uh, to the United Nations. Uh, Ray was very right. Uh, in 2015, the Philippines made a commitment of 70% uh, cutting of the carbon emissions as uh, our commitment or our INDC. No? Uh, it's called INDC because uh, it means uh, uh, that is not the final nationally determined contribution as Philippine commitment to the Paris Agreement. No? At present, the Philippine government, now I'm trying to use my lens uh, because of my work with uh, Climate Change Commission, but I wish to invoke uh, Chatham rules uh, because some information may still be classified as the, uh, should not be shared to the public. At present, at present uh, times, uh, when I talk of present right now, while we are talking, the Philippine government are still crafting our nationally determined contributions. Hopefully, before the end of this year, uh, there will be already a public campaign uh, to tell our people what will be our commitment uh, to the Paris Agreement uh, moving forward. No? So this would be the first official submission of the Philippines to the Paris Agreement that will form part of what we call the NDs. And all countries on this planet were given until the end or the lot of the midnight of 31st of December to submit their NDC. Now to your question, whether the Philippines will be able to achieve 70%. Okay. I just wanted to share with the class that the mindset of government right now is we are a developing country. That one we cannot deny. Okay. Historically, uh, climate change is caused by Develop world, develop world, meaning the industrialized countries. The call of the Philippine government is to have equality in this sense, that Philippines should be allowed to continue to develop. Therefore, in that case, we would expect an increase of our carbon emissions. Uh, I cannot say how much as of right now, but we have we we are expected to increase our carbon emissions because we have not achieved that state 
of industrialization. No? And since Philippines is considered to be, uh, well, not only considered to be, Philippines being one of the vulnerable countries, when we talk of one, I would rather say Philippines is the top or one of the top vulnerable countries. We always have to put that adjective, the top, you know, because we always belong to the top 10. You know? Palagi po tayong maganda ang ranking you know, pagdating sa, natural, sa mga disaster, natural hazards. Marang, maganda po ang ating ranking dyan. You know? Top 10 tayo dyan. You know? uh, I am not saying that I am proud of the ranking. And I'm not saying that you should be proud of the ranking as well. But what I'm saying that these are red flags that we have to address, no? Uh, because it destroys communities, uh, it kills uh, more lives, no? Uh, in our communities, no? So Philippines still have to achieve that level of industrialization. No? In one presentation of a UP economist that for every increase of 1% in GDP, there is a corresponding increase in our uh, contribution to greenhouse gases. So there is a direct proportion of our economic activity for every to, to our contribution to greenhouse gases. But you, we shouldn't be blamed because if you look at the statistics, our contribution is very small. No? Compared to the United States, who have contributed, if I'm not mistaken, one-fifth no, of the historical contributions, no, including European Union, or even right now, uh, one of the biggest contributors is China. No? So we have to be left uh, uh, to continue to grow no, so that we'll be able to lift a lot of our, of our fellow Filipinos out of poverty. No? And uh, if developed world will not be able to help developing nations like Philippines, it would be very difficult for this country to adapt to a changing climate. No? Because take note, we can never move the Philippines out of the tropical area. We can never move the Philippines out of the Pacific Ring of Fire. We can never move the Philippines out of the Pacific Ocean. So we will continue to receive typhoons, uh, perhaps uh, lesser rainfall, but of course we would continue to receive super typhoons in the next coming years. No? That one we cannot change. And if perhaps there is no country in this planet would be able to change the course of typhoons or even to divert typhoons. No? So hazards remain to be there. And if hazards are there, the only recourse of action for us and even for government is to ensure that people are adaptive, that communities are resilient. No? And if we cannot do that, then of course we would have the same recurring problem that we have. No? Last night I was giving a talk with uh, urban planners, uh, also, also via Zoom, uh, urban planners representing uh, different regions in the country, and they also asked the same uh, question. No? Uh, and I told them, you know, this is not only a government work, it requires actually the whole of the whole of nation approach. No? When I talk of government, I'm talking of national and I'm also talking of local. No? It is our responsibility to demand from our government leaders, both local and national, to address this issue, to, to help us be prepared on these particular hazards. No? Otherwise, uh, there is no way for us to respond to these hazards, especially if we belong to the vulnerable sectors of society. Of course, rich people, those who have the means can uh, address it. But of course, no, they can address it. They can adopt. Okay, they can install more air cons. They can install solar rooftops so that in case of uh, total brownout uh, on typhoons, uh, those, roof, those solar rooftops would, uh, would function and they can it would supply electricity in their in their household they can uh you know they can uh they can up their house if there will be a uh, potential flooding no kumbaga maglalagay sila ng maraming tambak para tumaas taas ang kanilang bahay kung ang kanilang area is a potential area of flooding all of these adaptation measures uh, can be done by by rich people but poor people cannot do it because they don't have the financial resources to do it that's why they need government to have that intervention in their communities. I hope, Ray, I answered your uh, question uh, sufficiently. But this year, uh, 
when uh, Climate Change Commission would uh, roll out to the public uh, our commitment to Paris Agreement, uh, it would be, uh, I think, on a sectoral basis. No, uh, when I talk of sectoral basis, uh, in in the policy, in terms of uh, our national determined contribution, meron kasi tinatawag na awit fe. Yun yung acronym, no? Awit fe. Uh, of course, A stands for uh, agriculture. Okay, uh, awit uh, W stands uh, uh, for waste. Uh, I stands for industry, AWIT P stands for transport, F uh, stands for uh, forest, and letter E stands for uh, energy. So all government agencies who work within this AWIT FE are the ones uh, calculating what are the targets of Philippines as we will commit to the, to the Paris Agreement. I hope I answered your question uh, sufficiently, Ray. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your answer, sir. All right. Thank you, Po. Um, I think we have another question po, from Mr. Al. Uh, it goes, I am one with you in mit mitigating climate change and in your lecture, you have discussed the link of human health and climate change. I just have a philosophical question. If Darwin's theory of evolution utilizes mutation is the driving force for survival of the fittest to happen is it possible that humans are not one of the fittest that this pandemic is one of nature's way of selecting the fittest and that humans can be possibly driven to extinction quite difficult question sir well, very difficult question <clears throat> Okay, I'll just share with you. Uh, I, early on, I made mention, uh, I always consider human beings as endangered species as well. Because uh, human lives are priceless in the same way that you also have to consider that animal lives are priceless. Uh, if you want animals, I mean, if we respect humans no, in terms of living in this planet, we also have to respect other living things who are existing in this planet. Um, if you're able to watch uh, one of the videos uh, um, curated by Conservation International, in one of the videos they said that this planet has survived for eight and a half billion years. Okay. No one of us can say that we can survive that long, eight and a half billion years. Even if I tell you that the rice terraces in the, in the Sagada or in the mountain province, this was constructed 2,000 years ago. But nobody can tell us at present time how these things were constructed because no one is living at this present time and 2,000 years old. So when you talk of the narrative, or when we talk of, or when we discuss the narrative of climate change, it is not actually a narrative of saving environment. It is not a narrative of planting more trees. It is not a narrative of the uh, eating plant base. That's not the only narrative uh, that we should that we should have. Although those are good initiatives those who are personal in nature or even uh, you know if it is implemented in an institution but the narrative of climate change should be saving humanity because in the onset if the worst impacts of climate change would be seen no one of us can be exempted you know, from the onslaught of this climate change Nobody will be exempted. No? When you saw the wildfires that happened in Australia at the early part of this year, which happened actually uh, the last quarter of 2019, we would, have, we would never thought that over half a million uh, koalas have died during that uh, wildfires. No? Not even humans have the capacity to save all of those koalas. 
not even humans have the capacity to save all of those koalas. So even, for example, we have that uh, flood that happened in Cagayan uh, Valley uh, after Typhoon Ulysses. Not even NDRRMC was able to save every life uh, who died in that uh, flooding that they experienced in the past few days. So I believe the narrative is not about saving environment because the environment will regenerate. You have to remember the environment will regenerate. No. It is a narrative of saving humanity because once I am gone, I am gone. Once you are gone, you are gone. You can no longer be regenerated. Your life is lost. No. So I believe that should be in a narrative. No. Uh, of course, the question of the question is a little bit scientific whether we can clone ourselves. I would rather let uh, uh, more science experts to answer that question whether people uh, really can mutate themselves uh, in the near future or uh, uh, you know in the decades to come. No? Uh, but I haven't seen uh, whether there would really be uh, this kind of scenario. Perhaps an experiment there is. No, perhaps an experiment uh, there is. No, try to imagine. Try to imagine. Have you ever thought what is the impact of plastic to human beings? Try to imagine. Have you ever thought what is the impact of plastic to a human person? Have you ever imagined whether science have used a human person to be the experiment? and ask him to eat plastic and see what will be the impact. Have you ever thought of that? Okay, so literally for humans, we don't know what is the impact of eating plastics, right? Because no human being would agree, perhaps to be part of an experiment, what would be the impacts of having or accumulating plastics in our body system right so i just leave that question to you because i have not come across of any scientific paper that uses human as their experiment of what would be the impact of plastic in a human body all right thank you sir and if i may add um, I think it's not exclusively nature's way of selecting the fittest, um, but rather it's nature's way of reacting to how we treat it because um, we have been abusing the planet ever since we were able to discover um, efficient ways on how we can extract um, resources, natural resources. And I think all these uh, natural disasters in the past few years are just nature's way or nature's revenge <laughs> on humanity's aloofness and, yeah, greed. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I think there's another question in the chat box. Po. Um, I think we'll just take this as the last one, siguro. Um, it's from Sir John Guiyang. Sorry if I may mispronounce your name, but um, after the government made the commitment of reducing the emission, were there were there changes applied in terms of policy and regulations for pollution control, like uh, improving existing social or institutional arrangements that facilitate environmental damage-reducing behavior? If there is, um, may you cite some of these and what and was it efficient enough? upon the application good evening again thank you for that question can i see the face of the person who asked that question oh there mr john logos right is that right yeah john logos okay Okay, uh, let me just clarify that the government has not submitted its uh, commitment to the Paris Agreement. Uh, we expect the government to submit its commitment uh, of reducing carbon emissions until the end of this year. But hopefully there would be multi-stakeholder consultation so that people would be aware what a commitment uh, we will submit uh, to the Paris Agreement. Okay. 
Uh, number two, in terms of the laws that you asked, if there are already policy instruments, no? uh, Philippines uh, undeniably have one of the advanced laws no? in terms of environment. Uh, we have the RA 9003, the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act, uh, enacted uh, over 20 years ago. We have the Philippine Clean Air Act. Uh, we have uh, multiple laws. No? We have even the NIPAS law or the NIPAS Act protecting uh, our protected areas. No? We even have green jobs, no? encouraging private sector uh, to concentrate on some uh, uh, green manufacturing practices or adopt green manufacturing practices. No? Philippines is actually regarded one of the leaders no? uh, in the international community to be very advanced in terms of, the, of laws. No? But of course, uh, while we are very advanced in terms of laws, we are very poor in terms of implementation. No? Yeah, very poor in terms of implementation. No? Uh, we can blame the national government and we can also blame our local government. No? Uh, you can just see that uh, in your respective communities, uh, but of course not so familiar in your area, no? in General Santos, but uh, here in Metro Manila, even if we, are R we have RA 9003 that's been enacted over 20 years ago, Still, segregation of waste is really a challenge, a total challenge for everyone. No, uh, I wonder really how they 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 dispose of the garbage uh, uh, that we produce uh, on a daily basis. No, uh, <clears throat> uh, Madam Durin, what is actually the part of the first question? I for just forgot. I only got the, the, the last part of the question. But I think the first part was interesting to answer as well. Um, after the government made the commitment of reducing the emission, were there changes applied in terms of policy and regulations for pollution control? Like improving existing social or institutional arrangements that facilitate environmental damage reducing behavior? Okay. First part. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. What I just wanted to share to John, you know, although I am not advocating for this answer, I just wanted to share with you, uh, just for you to pick up. Actually, the pandemic is actually a very nice solution, but I'm not saying that uh, there should be pandemic. No? That is not my messaging. But what I'm saying, the pandemic was very good, no? very good for the environment, because for the very first time, here in Metro Manila, if you go up the building of GMA 7 in Quezon City, you will be able to see Bataan Shrine. Well, in a normal, normally, in a normal day, you cannot see it no? because of the amount of pollution that is trapped in the air. But during pandemic, there are photos. No? In fact, uh, journalist Rafi Tima have that photo no? taken from the rooftop of GMA 7 and he can see Bataan Shrine. No? So you'll be able to see that during pandemic when there was total uh, no industrial activity, no? total no industrial activity, you'll be able to see that the skies are more bluer. No? There are no people on the streets, therefore there are no cars. Okay, So you'll be able to see, and we were able to give the planet the chance to regenerate, no? because that is part of uh, the process. Planet have to regenerate. But as I said, John, please do not misquote me. I am not advocating that a similar pandemic would happen. I am just sharing with you that these are the good silver lining effects no, uh, of the pandemic. Okay, These are the silver lining effects of the pandemic. The recent announcement to the Department of Energy, uh, Secretary Kusi, banning um, new application for cold-fired power plants, we have to welcome that announcement. At least you know, that would eventually address uh, some concerns no, in terms of uh, air pollution. We know that coal or the use of fossil fuel is one of the major driver of the, of the greenhouse gases. So if and when this becomes a reality, because what I know is just an announcement, there's still no paper signed uh, to affect this announcement. If and when this becomes a reality, that will be very good uh, for the Filipino people and of course to the world. No? Uh, at least um, our contribution to greenhouse gases uh, would be reduced. No? But just the same, also, I'm not saying that, uh, that uh, 
Uh, this is part of the reducing our goal to achieve industrialization. But if there is a good pathway uh, to proceed with industrialization without uh, maximizing uh, the use of fossil fuel, that would really be very great. All right, thank you, sir. Um, so I think um, that's it for our open forum. Now, I'm really thankful for everyone for all your questions and especially to engineer Federigan for answering all of them.